please join me in welcoming Dr. Lieberman. Hi. Um, I'd like to keep this informal, so if you, if you don't understand what I'm saying, please feel free to interrupt. Um, we'll just wait for this to uh, do its thing. Hopefully. Um, basically, uh, my, my uh, research has been involved in harnessing, trying to see what would be required to harness RNA interference for therapy. And I'm going to tell you a little bit, give you a little background on RNA interference, and then talk about how we've, we're attempting to solve some of the hurdles um, for developing it as therapy. Basically, RNA interference started with an observation in petunias about 15 years ago when um, Jorgensen was trying to make petunias that were more purple. And he introduced a transgene into the plants for the enzyme that makes purple pigment. And he was surprised to find that instead of more intense purple, some of the flowers came out, in fact, it had to be, look like they were lacking the pigment. And it took a long time before this phenomenon was understood. Um, really, it's only been understood in the last uh, four or so years. And it turns out that the mechanism involved, RNA interference, is conserved throughout evolution and probably plays a, a, a critical role in regulating gene expression of uh, endogenous genes um, in organisms, especially important genes involved in development and differentiation. And also, it's a kind of primitive immune system for primitive organisms to defend themselves against viruses that might insert into the genome and, and cause uh, chromosomal damage. So basically, how does it work? I'm not going to tell you the details. Actually, a lot of the details are still being worked out. But if we go back to the central paradigm of molecular biology, that the genetic code is, is in the DNA, it gets copied into RNA. The RNA gets processed, spliced, and capped into, to produce a messenger RNA. And from that template, uh, proteins are translated on ribosomes. And basically, uh, for the purposes of this lecture, we can think of RNA interference as a sequence-specific me mechanism for degrading the messenger RNA. So without the messenger, there's no protein expression. And it's a, a fairly rather specific way of silencing the expression of a gene according to a, a specific sequence. So since, um, so it's only about three years ago that it was found that this mechanism, which was initially described in plants and worms and flies, also exists in our cells. And uh, as soon as that first observation, our lab and a number of others have been involved in, in seeing if we could harness this phenomenon which, as far as we know, exists in all cells um, to treat uh, disease. Uh, and, and basically, uh, the, the diseases that could be treated are, are pretty unlimited. Um, so how does RNA interference work? So if a long piece of double-stranded RNA is introduced in cells, and you know, in plants, maybe 90% of viruses are encoded for by, by double-stranded RNAs. If, it's in, if it comes into cell, it's recognized by an enzyme called Dicer, and it's chopped up into pieces of about 19 to 24 base pairs uh, in length double-stranded RNAs that have uh, well-characterized ends that are recognized by a complex called the RISC, or RNA-induced silencing complex. And that double-stranded RNA is taken up by the complex. 
a helicase unwinds the double-stranded RNA so that only one strand binds. And if that strand is complementary to a, a target, targeted messenger RNA, it gets the risk becomes the slicer, so we have dice and slice. And the RNA is cut and it's rap and it loses its poly A tail and is, is rapidly degraded in the cell. Now it turns out that you know that this mechanism isn't only a way of protecting the organism from from exogenous outs, um, pieces of, of RNA, but it's also used by the cell. Um, basically, in the genome, there are, there, there, are, there are a number of these small hairpin structures that are encoded. They're in, often in re clusters of what used to be considered nonsense DNA, or they're in the introns of, of genes. These sh short hairpins get um, processed by the same enzyme by Dicer into sm small duplex pieces of RNA that then operate in this pathway. And it turns out that uh, many of these microRNAs, I think I'm losing my pointer, are, um, are extremely conserved. Like in th this is one microRNA, microRNA one. I'm just going to see if I have another pointer. Okay, let me just. And um, basically, the same sequence is found in worms and flies and humans. And these highly conserved pieces of of small RNA generally are recognized sequences in the three prime untranslated region of, of a message. And instead of cutting, targeting that messenger RNA for degradation, they basically are believed to block translation. So the, those microRNAs and the exogenous double-stranded RNAs are both processed by Dicer and use the same types of enzymes to operate in cells. But unlike um, the, the small siRNAs or small interfering RNAs, the microRNAs are basically thought to, to act and block the initiation of translation. They don't work as usually as effectively as the siRNAs, and usually it's thought that you need multiple copies of the microRNAs binding to a gene to effectively silence it. <coughs> now, um, the, the probably the best characterized example of microRNAs are uh, in worms, where two small RNAs called LIM4 and LET7 were found to be expressed um, here. This LIN4 comes up at the end of larval stage one in the worm and then uh, uh, um, continues to be expressed. It targets another gene called LIN14, and when that gene gets silenced, the worm can move on to the next larval state. So it's these really important decisions in development that seem to be regulated by this process. I think you'll be hearing a lot more about this phenomenon in the future, which is why I took the time um, to tell you about it. Now, because uh, RNA interference was part of a primitive immune system, when we heard that it was going to, that it was working with mammalian cells, we immediately set out to see if we could harness it. Um, as an antiviral mechanism against HIV. And our notion was that uh, we could silence the expression either of viral genes or of host genes, like the receptors or co-receptors that are important in infection of HIV. So if a T cell didn't have the receptor or co-receptor required to internalize HIV, then it wouldn't become infected. And ba basically, our first experiment, which was a, a sort of a proof of concept, was to silence the CD4 
receptor for HIV using siRNA. And we used an indicator cell line which stains blue when it becomes infected with HIV. So these are the control cultures. There are a lot of blue cells. And the cells form syncytia, or uh, multicellular, multinuclear um, cells. Um, this is an uninfected control. And by silencing the receptor, we're able to significantly block uh, HIV infection. And this is a control with another siRNA. So the idea was that we could block entry of the virus into the cell by either blocking the receptor or a co-receptor. And it turns out the receptor for HIV is an essential immune molecule. You wouldn't want to silence it as part of, of therapy. But the co-receptor, CCR5, that's responsible for sexual transmission of HIV is completely non-essential. People who have mutated CCR5 CCR5 are completely normal, but they're resistant to HIV infection. And basically, uh, we, we and others have been able to target a number of different parts of viral genes. Practically every HIV gene has been targeted, including the non-coding uh, long terminal repeat, which, can, which regulates gene expression uh, for the virus. So basically, the, the notion is, is similar to what's done for, with antiviral drug therapy. Namely, we can, hit, we can inhibit the virus at different parts of its life cycle. So here, the virus comes in. It has to bind to receptor. The viral envelope fuses with the cell membrane. It uncoats. This is the capsid with the um, RNA of the virus. Potentially, the viral uh, genome could be targeted uh, before reverse transcription, or if the virus uh, became reverse transcribed and integrated in the chromosome, you could target any of a number of HIV genes to prevent the production of viral proteins and new virions. And, and because this is a, a sequence-specific uh, process, you, you might worry that HIV, which mutates very readily, could escape from, from RNA interference. And that's why our strategy has been to target multiple genes at once and to also target host genes, which are not um, undergoing mutation. So just show you an example of um, some in vitro work we did with HIV. We looked at macrophages, which are an important drug-resistant uh, reservoir for HIV in the body. And basically, we found, and in this slide, we're staining all the cells in the culture red with actin. And in the bottom, we're staining cells that are infected with HIV with um, probe for HIV RNA in green. So um, maybe you can't see this, but in, if we targeted the, ho the viral co-receptor CCR5, we got a good suppression, but not complete suppression of the virus. Same if we targeted the viral capsid gene. But if we targeted both together, we got complete suppression of HIV in vitro. And um, the, we, in the same experiment, if we looked at the production of viral particles by these macrophages, we found that we're, there was much less gag um, capsid protein in the supernatants. In fact, that background levels, if we targeted both the host gene and the HIV capsid gene, we got good suppression, but not complete suppression if we targeted uh, only one. And these are, this is the control level of viral production. And what was surprising was that the silencing lasted for weeks. In fact, it lasted for as long as we could keep these cells in culture, which was three weeks. And that's, that suggested to us 
that we might be able to develop this as a microbicide to prevent transmission of HIV. So one of the main, so there's no uh, good vaccine for HIV and preventing transmission is really the key to controlling the infection. Where, where it's being synthesized. So we're, it's being synthesized by a company and, and, and then we, we add it to cells. And in the in vitro experiments, we add it to cells with a transfection reagent, a, a lipid, to get it into, because these molecules don't just go into cells without, without some special delivery mechanism. So that becomes the real obstacle for in vivo um, therapy. But we thought that um, we might be able to solve the delivery problem locally, say in the genital mucosa, and the advan and because we can get silencing for weeks at a time, it might be possible to uh, prevent to to create a reagent that could be used every couple of weeks and didn't have to be used just before you have sex, which is one of the main um, impediments to microbicide. So first, we wanted to see if we could deliver these molecules into the, vag into the, uh, the epithelium of, of, the, of mice. And in this case, we, we, la we labeled the the small interfering RNAs with uh, fluorescence, uh, with FITSI, to make, to make them glow green. And what you can see, this, and they're introduced into the vaginas of mice with a lipid, the same kind of lipid that we would use to transfect cells in vitro. And we're amazed to find that the siRNAs were taken up not only at the super, superficial uh, epithelial cells, but deep into the tissue. And not only were they taken up, but they also very effectively silenced gene expression. So in this experiment, we took a mouse in which every cell uh, expresses green fluorescent protein. Every cell glows green. And so this is the control mouse. These are just sort of microscopic views of, of the vaginal mucosa. You see um, the tissue is green. This is a control siRNA. And with an siRNA directed against green fluorescent protein, the tissue is black. We're able to not only deliver the small interfering RNAs, but also to silence expression. Now, there isn't a good mouse model for HIV, but so we thought we'd look at another infection for which there is a good uh, mouse model, herpes simplex virus. So that's the virus that causes, um, you know, genital herpes, a, a related virus causes cold sores, and we developed a series of small RNAs that targeted three different uh, viral genes and we're able, to, uh, we're able to suppress um, viral replication in vitro. And then we actually, cha on the first experiment, we challenged the mice with a lethal dose of this virus. And we got um, um, pretty amazing protection. So this is the um, hematoxylin and eosin stain of the vaginal mucosa of a normal mouse. This is the epithelium here. If we uh, treat the mice with this lethal dose of herpes, the whole mucosa is completely disrupted. The epithelium is gone. It's eroded. And there's a lot of inflammatory infiltrate. The same if we use the control siRNA. But if we use um, this siRNA directed against the herpes virus gene, you see the mucosa is much more preserved. And if we use two of them, it looks very similar to the normal tissue. And in fact, these mice developed symptoms of, um, of herpes infection, high, you know, hind limb paralysis, and we're about to die when we, um, when we sacked them. 
and these mice did not. So we're very optimistic that we may be able to actually develop this as a microbicide to prevent infection. Uh, actually, in that experiment, we gave them, um, I think, two or either two or three, I'm not sure. Within like one day or over? Yes, within a day before infection. So, but we're, we're also very interested in developing this as a more, so it's relatively easy to, to well, it's not easy, nobody's really done it, but uh, it, it turned out to be relatively easy to deliver these molecules locally, but we're also interested in treating other kinds of more systemic diseases. So, um, so basically, I just want to go over some of the issues involved in using this as a therapeutic. Um, and some have uh, touted RNA interference as the next new, likely new class of, of drugs that are going to come uh, into play. And the first um, INDs have been filed for, for testing RNA interference in the eye for macular degeneration, and, and clinical studies are likely to begin within a month or so. So why are people excited? One reason is this, the specificity of silencing. So basically, you have a 19 nucleotide sequence that has to match pretty closely with the target in ter terms of getting silencing. Since the initial um, description, it turns out that the silencing isn't completely specific, that you can have less complete homology and have some off-target effects, especially by this microRNA phenomenon that I told you about. However, most of those effects require high concentrations and can probably be avoided in large part as we learn more about the mechanism. However, this specificity may become a problem, as I alluded to, for to treat viruses which can mutate and which also generally exist in, in a number of different uh, variants within um, populations. This, this mechanism is extremely potent. Uh, perhaps you've heard about antisense. This is about a thousand-fold more potent. The reason it's so potent is that it, it's basically a catalytic process. Once that small RNA gets into the risk, it can be used over and over again to target, you know, different mRNA molecules. The double-stranded RNAs are, are, are fairly stable in, in the serum, but they're not completely stable. However, there are strategies available for chemically modifying the riboses on the RNAs to make them resistant um, to RNases in, in the body. They're relatively cheap and simple to make, and basically all cells have this mechanism. So basically almost any target cell or disease could be targeted, but the main therapeutic challenge is how to get these molecules into cells. Even cells like macrophages and dendritic cells that are actively constantly sampling the environment don't take up these molecules without assistance. So there are basically two strategies that you could use to deliver these molecules. One is gene therapy, where you would express, where you would use a vector to express one of those, the SI, an siRNA precursor as a, one of those hairpin stem loop structures that would then um, be processed within cells into siRNAs. There are a number of problems with gene therapy, um, which I'm not going to go into, but um, basically the most serious is probably the fact that the vector can insert into our chromosome and cause cancer by, by inserting close to an oncogene. 
It may be that if you had a, have a, a genetic defect where a single gene, a mutated gene, is causing the problem, that gene therapy might make the most sense because it would pr theoretically provide lifelong protection. The other approach is to think of siRNAs as a small molecule drug. And then the problem is, how do you get it across the cell membrane? I'm going to just show you briefly um, an example of the, the gene therapy approach, uh, which was uh, performed by some friends of mine in Iowa and was just published this summer in Nature Medicine. And basically, they took advantage of the exquisite sensitivity of RNA interference to target a single nucleotide polymorphism in a gene that causes ataxia, or uh, it's a neurodegenerative disease with loss of balance. So um, they're able to design a, an adenoviral vector to target the mutated allele, but to leave the wild-type gene expression unaffected. And basically, uh, mice, there, there are transgenic mice who have the gene that causes the ataxia. And uh, with time, within a few months, they develop this progressive neurological disease. And in this experiment, um, Dr. Davidson injected directly into the brain of the mice uh, an adeno-associated virus, which encoded for a short hairpin RNA, one of these stem loops that gets processed into uh, siRNA, and targets the mutant um, gene allele, but not the wild type. And basically, by direct injection, she was able to get uh, this, this um, vector had a green fluorescent protein tag on it. So you, these green cells, basically all the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum, which are the target cells for this disease, took up the short hairpin RNA. And she was able to um, see a, a, an impressive improvement in ataxia. So basically what, what she did was use this sort of what's called a roto rod. It's a, they put the mice on this rod which turns and they turn it faster and faster and faster and as mice that have impaired balance or ataxia fall off and you just measure the time it takes them to fall off. <laughs> so these are normal mice and these are the mice with the, with the transgene and these are the mice that were treated. So they, she got uh, impressive clinical benefit. And if, when she looked in the brains, the mice that have the disease have um, aggregates of a protein called ataxin that causes the disease. And the mice that were treated with the adenoviral vector were, had almost not, none of these deposits. So I think this, this shows that as a gene therapy, this, um, and particularly for like these neurodegenerative diseases for which there is no treatment, it suggests the possibility that this may provide some benefit. Um, but most, most of my work, has, and we're doing some work with vectors um, looking at sickle cell disease, which is also a gene caused by a single nucleotide change. And we've been able to design siRNAs that silence the sickle gene, but not normal globin. But most of our effort has actually been on trying to develop these siRNAs as drugs. So. One of the problems is that they have a very short half-life in the body of seconds. And part of this is because they get filtered by the kidney and get excreted very rapidly. And the other is that they do get degraded to some extent by, by RNases. Our lab actually had the first 
demonstration that you could use siRNAs as a drug to protect mice from a disease. And I'm going to show you that, that experiment. For that experiment, what we did was to, we used this really artificial method of getting the siRNAs into, into cells, which is we injected a huge volume into the tail vein of mice, and it's called hydrodynamic injection, basically about a fifth of the whole mouse blood volume. What that does is it puts such a load on the heart that the pressures in the, in the venous system rise, and that increased pre hydrostatic pressure basically forces the siRNAs into cells. Now, most people, and I would agree, would say, you can't do that in people. You throw them into heart failure, you can risk death. Um, and in fact, so far, no, no one has shown that there's any delivery method that works in large animals. So uh, in trying to think about strategies around the delivery problem, one approach is, like I showed you for the microbicide, to look at conditions where ju you just need local delivery, and that'll work. And I think the microbicide is an example of that, and the eye, where some of the biotech companies are going to be um, doing clinical trials, is another example. Another possible approach would be to catheterize the vein, draining an organ, and inject um, what would be a well-tolerated um, volume load to, to just to create uh, high pressure locally. And we've been able to do this um, in mice in the kidney and protect them from acute renal failure, and I'll, I'll show you that. In general, people think that going, uh, trying to target organs that have high blood flow, like the liver, is a good place to go. Of course, if you could devise a method to deliver these siRNAs only into the cells that you want to target, that would be preferential because then if there's any off-target effects or toxicity, it could be mitigate, you know, minimized by only introducing the siRNAs into the cells that you're interested in. And I'm going to show you, if we have time, a method we figured out for doing that. Quick question. Yep. Yeah, actually, um, it is. It's been done in mice. So you can take a, and you know, one of the people I collaborate with has done this. You can take a lentivirus or a retrovirus and inject it into either an embryo or a embryonic stem cell and get it to be expressed throughout the organism and to silence gene expression. So if we had a different president, maybe these kinds of approaches uh, could be uh, pursued. I know. <laughs> it's a bummer. Yeah. Well, it's not diffusion. I think what happened, yeah, yeah. As diffusion? No, that doesn't work. It's a, it's not a, it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about the first siRNA therapeutic <laughs> experiment in mice. And basically, the first trick was to see if we could get the siRNA into, into, we, we decided to, to, to use the liver because that has a lot of, uh, has very good blood flow and because this hydrodynamic injection had been shown previously to be able to introduce plasmids into liver cells. So basically we took a mill of solution and injected it within like a few seconds into mice and we're delighted to find that about 90% of the liver cells, which were stained with albumin, took up a fluorescently labeled siRNA. So here we're looking at flow cytometry. On the y-axis, we're looking at the 
uptake of the fluorescent siRNA on the x-axis were staining liver cells for albumin. And here you can see most of the liver cells took it up. Not only, and we decided to target a death receptor called FAS. Why did we do that? Um, there are no good mouse models for the kinds of hepatitis that, that we get. But you could, there are sort of artificial molecule m models. And it turns out that the hepatitis viruses that infect us don't kill liver cells by themselves. They're not cytopathic. What kills the liver cells are the immune cells that infiltrate the liver, move into the liver, and those immune cells express something called fast ligand. When the liver is inflamed, it expresses a molecule called FAS, which is a death receptor. When that death receptor gets engaged by FAS ligand on activated immune cells, it triggers cell death and the liver cells die. So we thought if we could silence the death receptor, we could protect the mice from hepatitis. And in fact, when we injected siRNAs directed at that death receptor FAS, we found that we could silence FAS expression by about 90 percent. And that that silencing actually lasted for 10 days. In two weeks, we begin to see FAS expression come back. And by three weeks, it's back to normal. I think that's a good result because it means you won't have long-term suppression of FAS, which could be dangerous, but it's long enough that you could think of having a, a sort of prolonged therapeutic effect. So we could silence FAS. We showed that the liver cells with silenced FAS were resistant to cell death triggered by FAS. So in our first experiment, we pre-treated the mice with either a control siRNA or a fast siRNA by this hydrodynamic injection, waited a day, and then injected this plant lectin called concannavalin A. And what concannavalin A does is it nonspecifically activates T cells. They move into the liver. They get activated to express fast ligand and trigger a fulminant hepatitis. And basically, the results were pretty dramatic. In the control mice, there's a lot of liver cell death. And there's these blue cells or inflammatory infiltrates that are moving into the liver to, to eat up the dead cells. In the fast siRNA-treated livers, the, there, was a, there was still some cell death, but it was markedly reduced and there was very little inflammation. And in fact, if you look at the release of liver enzymes into the blood, which is the assay that doctors use to follow patients with hepatitis, what you can see is that in the treated mice, that the levels were markedly reduced. They're, they're about three times normal, about 100, 150, compared to 4,000 or so in the control mice. So we had a dramatic improvement in hepatitis. Now, usually you don't know in advance that you're going to get hepatitis. So we thought we'd try to move to something that's a little bit more clinically relevant. So we, in this model, we injected the mice every week with, with concannavalin A, but waited until after the second and fourth weeks to give them the FAST siRNAs. And because of this sort of weekly injection, you develop a more chronic kind of hepati hepatitis, more like, a little bit like cirrhosis, where there's uh, a lot of fibrosis in the liver. And again, we found that the FASA siRNAs were remarkably protective. So in the control mice, in this case, the blue bands are, are fibrous um, tissue and in the fast siRNA treated mice, there was almost no fibrosis. That's the, another, so that we have two controls, one in which we inject the mice just with salt water, and the other where we take a siRNA against GFP as a control. 
And if we looked at biochemical markers for fibrosis, we also found a dramatic reduction. And then the, the last experiment we did with these mice was we, there, if you inject a fast antibody into the mice, they, they all, it's a very fulminant hepatitis. They all die within a day or two. So that, that seemed like a pretty stringent challenge. But because they die so quickly, we, again, pre-injected the mice with either control salt water or an irrelevant siRNA or fast siRNA, waited a day, injected them with the fast antibody, and just looked to see if they survived. And it, here again, the results were pretty amazing. The mice in, that received fast siRNAs that were effective at silencing, about 80% of them died, and all of the control mice died. So we're able to efficiently deliver the siRNAs, albeit by this sort of not very practical method. Uh, we could get long-lived silencing, um, and we could protect mice from death. So look pretty good. Right, and in that experiment, we looked at multiple, we wanted to make sure this was really specific and not some sort of off-target effect. So in that experiment, we had three different sequences to different parts of FAST, and they all worked. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there is, there is that potential. We didn't see any obvious indication of other genes being silenced. We looked at a whole series of genes. But it's possible that there were effects that we didn't see, but they didn't appear to be important clinically, at least in the mice. But it is something that we have to worry about. So, as I said, the hydrodynamic injection isn't very practical, but we thought maybe we could introduce the siRNAs through a vein into an organ and get, um, see if we could get protection because people are catheterized in the hospitals all the time. So this is something that could be practical. So it turns out that FAST is also important in another important medical problem. When you cut off the blood supply to an organ, like the heart in a heart attack, there's an initial area of cell death where the cells die by necrosis. When the blood supply comes back, the area of cell death expands, usually by about threefold, by a process that's actually FAST mediated. So we thought, well, maybe we could use FAST to block this reperfusion injury and so we, we, we looked in the kidney, and actually um, the kidney tubule cells are very sensitive to this reperfusion injury, and um, their death is, causes acute kidney failure, and it's one of the main causes of death in intensive care units in hospital. And I'm not going to show you the data, but basically um, this is an experiment where we either injected the mice with the a fast siRNA water or a GFP siRNA. And we found that if we, if we put it in 100 microliters volume into the renal vein, we got just as good protection as with hydrodynamic injection. So it looks like we can we may actually be able to deliver this locally into organs through a catheter. And I, in the last few minutes, I'd just like to tell you about how we figured out, we figured out a way to actually target the siRNAs into specific cells. So um, basically what we wanted to do was take advantage of a cell surface receptor um, to target siRNAs RNAs only into cells that express that receptor. And as a model system, we use the HIV envelope as a target. And basically what we did is we took 
a, a piece of an antibody to the HIV envelope, hooked it up to something that would bind siRNAs, mixed it with the siRNAs, and found that we could get it to work. So uh, this is a complicated slide. Let me walk you through it. Uh, basically, we took, in this case, uh, this is just sort of a model system. We took HeLa cells that produce green fluorescent protein, our favorite tool. And uh, we're going to, del so we're going to have HeLa cells that are either transfected with HIV or not. So some, the cells on the top have no um, HIV envelope on their cell surface. The ones on the bottom express HIV envelope. But in these cultures, only some of the cells are infected. And what we're doing is monitoring the infection by staining for the production of the HIV capsid protein. So in this, if you look at this panel, the cells on the right stain for HIV gag, they're infected. The cells on the left don't, they're not infected. And on the y-axis, we're looking at this green fluorescent protein. So all the cells are green. These are the uninfected cultures. In the infected cultures, as we introduce more siRNAs with using our antibody delivery, what you can see is that the green fluorescent protein signal declines, and it only declines in the cells that express the HIV envelope. So we're getting specific delivery. If we just add the siRNAs without the delivery mechanism, nothing happens. And if we use a fast siRNA, it has no effect on GFP. So to look at whether we could use this in mice, um, we basically made a melanoma cell line uh, either express, transfected it to express HIV envelope or not. We injected 5 million of these melanoma cells into the flanks of mice and inoculated the mice either directly into the tumor or intravenously with siRNAs designed to target a cocktail of oncogenes. So we first found that, the, that by silencing these oncogenes, we could inhibit the growth of the tumor cells in vitro. And then we wanted to see what we could do in vivo. And basically, it worked. Um, so on the, on the top, uh, so first we're going to look at delivery delivery of fluorescently labeled siRNAs. They're green. And we're looking at, this is direct injection into the tumor, either into a tumor that doesn't express the HIV envelope or a tumor that does. And what you can see is that if there's no envelope expression, the siRNA does not get taken up. But if there is, it gets taken up but it only gets taken up by the tumor cells and not by the normal uh, cells down here. If we just inject the siRNA, very little of it gets taken up. And if we inject it with a lipid, uh, we get uptake not only into the tumor but into the normal tissue. And um, this also works if we inject the the antibody co siRNA complex into the tail vein, and this time we're doing it under low pressure in a small volume. So only in the tumor that expresses the HIV envelope do we get uptake. We don't get uptake into the normal tissue, and we don't get uptake if we just inject the small, low volume of siRNAs. And not only that, but we can actually suppress the growth of the tumor. So these are various controls. And um, so the last injection of siRNAs was on day three. When we measure the size of the tumor, it's, much, it's growing much more slowly in the, in the treated mice than the controls. 
And if we sacrifice the mice here, the weight of the tumor is much less. So this is just sort of a first stab at trying to develop a way where we can deliver siRNAs into cells in vivo and get it to work. And that's the end of my talk. So this is DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. And basically this mechanism is a, a sequence specific, the small RNA binds in a sequence specific manner to the messenger RNA. And, and it binds in a complex called the RISC. We can go b back over that. Okay, and you want this, okay. So dice and slice. Um, but if you introduce the small RNA, it gets, it's a double-stranded RNA that has a free 5 prime end and a 3 prime hydroxyl with overhangs, two nucleotide overhangs. That gets recognized by something called the RISC or RNA-induced silencing complex. Now, this is a protein complex, and, um, and basically there's a helicase, and that helicase hasn't been identified, which basically starts at the 5 prime end and unwinds the double strand, and then only one strand binds to the risk. And within the risk, there's a protein called argonaut, which is the slicer, and it, it basically makes a nick in the DNA, in the target um, DNA, right in the middle of the sequence. And um, when, the, when, that, when the target messenger RNA is nicked, the RNA that doesn't have a poly A tail on it, like most messenger RNA, gets degraded. And this all happens in the cytoplasm of cells. After it finds its target and cuts it, then it can go back again and find another target and cut. And actually what we found is that the, how long this lasts in cells is determined in part by whether or not there's a target here for it to find. So if, if there's no matching target, the small RNA uh, has actually has a short um, half life in cells. Yeah. Yeah. The the natural ones are produced as these hairpins, so they they're sort of like those palindromic sequences, and those hairpins get pro they they're they're you know the, the message that encodes those hairpins gets produced as a precursor in the nucleus. It gets recognized by a, uh, a, uh, a nucleolytic uh, protein called drasha, which cuts it into another precursor. That precursor gets recognized by the export machinery in the nucleus. It leaves the nucleus, goes to the cytoplasm, where then Dicer can cut it into the, the small duplex with these overhangs. Hepatitis A, uh, which is an acute kind of hepatitis, is a cytopathic virus. So that virus, when it infects liver cells, it kills the liver cells itself. itself. Hepatitis B and C, if we didn't have an immune response, they would co it would coexist with our livers without any problem. So for hepatitis B and C, the killing of the liver cells is fast mediated. Even for a lot of other kinds of hepatitis that aren't caused by viruses, the final common pathway is tickling that death receptor on, on the liver cells. So FAST is important in hepatitis through a lot, caused by a lot of different uh, causes. Uh, well, people are looking at it for, um, Basically, any of them could, uh, could potentially be targeted. This seems really hot. Is there a race on to 
Yeah, this is very hot. I mean, this was like in, in 2002, this was the molecule of the year in science. Um, there are a number of bio, there are several biotech companies, including one in Cambridge, El Nylum, that's trying, that's racing to develop this as a therapy. Um, so there are some companies that are racing to do the gene therapy side of things and some the small molecule side of things. And the mo right now, the, the big pharmaceutical companies are not, they, they sort of have partnered themselves with some of these small companies. And, but there's, there's also like a revolution Another, this is being used as a tool in, um, by drug companies, by laboratories all over the world now. So it, it's, you know, in, in flies and worms, you can do these mutation screens and identify a gene that's involved in a process. This, this mechanism is now being used to develop screens for mammalian cells. So drug companies are using it to try to pick out targets for different diseases for which they could develop drugs. It's like completely revolutionized um, biology research and drug development in like a, just within a couple of years. Yeah. Unless you think of it as, unless you're developing it for gene therapy, it would have to be administered for chronic diseases uh, repetitively. Yeah, the, actually, if you go online, I just, there's, I just wrote a review for the annual reviews of medicine that's online. If you have online access yeah, or. Um, like yeah. And there I could get, I can give you some other sort of, mine is more oriented towards the, what are the medical applications, but if you want other reviews, I can direct you to them too. Thank you.